The news of the week is DeepSeek. It came out of nowhere. This is a Chinese startup creating a AI that everyone says is even better than chat GPT at a lot cheaper price. Uh, for people who don't know anything about DeepSeek, what should we know about it? I think first and foremost, people should know that these AI systems, whether they're whether it's DeepSeek or OpenAI systems or other systems put out by Google, Gemini, Anthropic, et cetera, are all using our personal data and are using essentially algorithms, which are patterns that are applied to bodies of data to mimic human expression. So none of these systems would be worth a penny or even able to exist without the essential acquisition through essentially an, a surveillance-based model and the extraction of our personal data, mind you, without any form of compensation or even appropriate disclosure. So that's the most important thing I think to note in terms of the specifics of DeepSeek relative to the Silicon Valley models. Um, the DeepSeek revelations are, are a revelation because uh, they were essentially able to train and refine their language models based on validated studies I've looked at using open source data and open source input. And this is a big story in the history of the internet and the web. Even big tech companies like Meta tend to profit off of open source input, almost never without any form of compensation, but they, their technologies themselves tend to be closed you know, as I described, as I described on democracy now, walled gardens and sort of invisible silos for behavioral modification, because they tend to feed us content to construct a sense of desire and construct consumption and construct beliefs and therefore divide us in ways that we're barely aware of. And already we're hearing talk of the Trump administration in response to deep seek, uh, imposing new tariffs on Chinese uh, on chips. On, on computer chips for the Chinese market. Yeah. Why does the Trump administration see DeepSeek as a threat? And a follow up is like, should should normal people like who are not involved in tech is do you see DeepSeek as a threat to working like average people, or do you see the potential as some tech people do for progress here for helping with human progress? I mean, look, it's actually Biden's export ban on the Nvidia chips. NVIDIA is one of the biggest companies on all of Silicon Valley, a chip maker whose chips are actually powering many of these AI systems, especially the Silicon Valley systems. It was Biden's export ban on those chips that forced this type of resourceful innovation by the mm. Chinese. So if anything, this sort of like closure and kind of this attempt to be nationalist and a duopoly in relation to all these AI and tech is going to leave the U.S. further behind. And it's 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 a silly and sort of navel gazing type of response, in my opinion. It's not it's not going to really help because here's the key thing with tech: people don't really realize this or recognize this, but it's something I've been studying for about twenty years. Um, most amazing breakthroughs in tech don't come from just sort of this myth of abundant and infinite resources, abundant and infinite kind of zombie investment capital, what Varoufakis calls techno feudalism, and now Steve Bannon is literally appropriating that language literally appropriating that language. He's, he's quoting things that I, that I teach in my PhD courses, literally. So the key, the key thing is most tech innovation comes, and this is one of the coolest things about tech, and it's always been this case, by kind of putting stuff out there and getting other people's input. And it's always been that, like a lot of, this, this dates back to hacker and free software and open source culture. So the Chinese just went back to the basics of how almost every major internet technology was formed, which was getting support from the developer, global developer community. So this idea of kind of walling things off and thinking that you're going to win that war is an incredibly retrenched and very naive and infantile idea, and it's not going to work. Is there anything more like nefarious about China's programs than about America's programs when it comes to data collection? Uh, because that certainly is the narrative that we get from the mainstream media and from yeah. uh, U.S. politicians. Yeah. I've been combing like the CNBC discourse on this, the Fox News discourse on this, and other kind of vantage points. I always do that to kind of to kind of understand and survey the landscape. There's no question that Chinese tech um, tech platforms, just like tech industries, are built upon intimate surveillance of our lives, or or their lives, or maybe the lives of others as well, and the transformation critical point of almost anything and everything into binary integers, into data points. So no question that there's a large scale kind of, you know, Pac-Manning 
slurping up of, of our lives and, and our data that are, inform the Chinese large language models, including the deep seek model that is kind of um, taken over um, the, the downloads as we speak. But you know, the thing about the US, as you well know, and I've, I've seen your reporting on this for years, is we like to sort of use a lot of high level moralizing and a, and a lot of this sort of like, well, we have the democratic values and so on. When we know with Silicon Valley, it's clearly evident whether it's, and it's a bipartisan issue, it's actually a very universally accepted vision that these companies are far from democratic. And yet they, there's all this kind of hand wringing about American values. So it just doesn't, it just doesn't add up. It's highly sanctimonious and hypocritical. And we don't know, we've never known, we don't know and we've never known on a very intimate level, the actual, the actual ways in which data are being collected about all of us um, by American tech companies that's still never been properly disclosed. And that's the bare minimum that we would need for this to be even close to democratic. We have to start with transparency, move toward accountability, and then the greater state would be more distributed governance. So this is that's just a long way of saying that there's we, we can assume that whether it's American or Chinese, that everything's being collected about us. And we also know both in China and certainly true in the US that data can be aggregated. So Katie, it could be your data that's gathered by Instagram, about your clicks, your eyeballs, what, et cetera, and it, this and that, but that data can be aggregated with your credit card record. So sure, I present myself as always having a great time, the coolest person ever on Instagram, but what if that data is aggregated with me buying like 40s and hot dogs and cigarettes and four locos after midnight at the local 7-Eleven? That's a different lens into a human's identity. So the point being that we should assume that everything's being monitored at all times and turned into data, digital footprints. And that's what Cambridge Analytica and others did. And we see next to nothing that's actually occurred since all those, since that whole scandal dating back to 2016. How concerned are you about the usage of natural resources for AI? I recently learned, I couldn't believe this, that for every question you ask chat GPT, something like a bottle of water is consumed. Um, is that true? And you know, how concerned should we be that this like advancement in artificial intelligence comes at the expense of our natural resources, including including the most precious one, water? Yes, um, it, the, these are what we call externalities. So everything from energy resources to the extraction of rare earth minerals, to labor costs, to cooling costs, which is tied to water, to energy costs to power these server infrastructures, which is what um, this so so-called Stargate initiative is. It's just data servers and AI server, servers and infrastructures. There's massive expenses involved with all of this, including cryptocurrency mining. Note, David Sachs has a very prominent seat in as Trump's cryptos are, right? There's this incredibly intimate marriage we're seeing between big tech oligarchy and the state. Um, so we should be very concerned about it because one the one big issue that I that kind of really bothers me and that I see again and again and again is we as Americans or just consumers or people more generally, we're never able to appropriately visualize the costs and benefits of almost everything because everything gets externalized, you know, uh, thrown under the, the kind of mat. And we only realize how important those what are called externalities are later, right? Like you narrowly optimize to build up Flint, Michigan, and then you pollute the, the river. This is a very, to me, it's a very analogous example. So we sh it should be extremely clear what are the costs, financial, environmental, labor, et cetera, from a planetary vision. Because I literally work in parts, I've I've tr I've gone in Congolese rare earth mineral mines and gotten kicked out looking for coltan and cobalt on the Congo Uganda border, places like that. This is all coming from the earth and from our bodies and from our planet and from our our economies, meaning our pocketbooks for the extraction of value that is often tied that is that is often not tied to profitability but predictions of future valuation. That's why a lot of the tech companies are sort of zombie kind of platforms because their profitability is not always correlated with their valuation. Amazon, for example, didn't make any money for its first decade. Uber's barely made any money ever. So this is a long, again, sort of, uh, I, I think all these things are connected. We need to be able to really visualize the costs and benefits of almost every sort of digital uh, in interaction that we have. And that's, of course, intentionally designed to be invisible in our lives.